two horses out there and it, um, you know, and it helps your parasite load. This is within a rotation, and so you don't necessarily have to have horses and sheep in one paddock at one time. Um, and that's, that's a consideration. Um, I don't know how many of you have tried grazing horses with other livestock in the same pasture. How was it? Did they do okay? Uh-huh. Yeah. So they can definitely get acquainted and, and be okay together. Anyone had a poor experience? So you can definitely have negative in, interactions. Um, what I've personally seen most often is bored horses love to chase smaller animals. And that... <laughs> Through the fence. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, I, yeah, I've certainly had horses push sheep and cattle out of pastures. I've seen my dairy cows at a full gallop with their udders swinging back and forth with the horses just like happy as a clam coming after them. Um, so, <laughs> you can certainly have problems like that. Um, but there are ways to, uh, to get around that. And so maybe I'll go ahead and show you what we do. Actually, I have a slide later on. So I'm probably making you dizzy back there with the <laughs> camera. But um, all right. So um, and then so we've talked a little bit about these things that the other thing I think with horses is that horses tend to hold sort of a, this particular place in our hearts. A lot of times people have horses, not because they need horses, but because they want to have horses. Um, and that feeds their soul in a certain way. And they want to um, be really kind to their animals. They want to make them happy and contented. Um, so you can, you can put horses in a very small area, but as you say, they need to move a lot. You can, um, you know, keep a horse in a stall and feed them hay. Um, I think when you start to look at them as they, you know, in ways they can fit into the systems, you can start to develop those systems so that you can keep those animals content while still um, taking care of the rest of your system. So uh, these are a few pictures of things that you can do with horses. Uh, obviously, we've talked a lot about eating over mature forage. And in this picture, you can see the, um, the difference between a horse grazed paddock and an over mature paddock. So as the horses move through, you lose some of this frazz that is not going to feed your sheep or your goats or your um, cattle very well, but can certainly keep your horses in good flesh. Um, horses are really great at opening up the soil surface. You may have noticed that about them. Um, one thing that we've done on our farm is to try to direct that to areas where we need to open the soil surf surface so that we can put down seed. It's a tool that you have to be really careful with because the other thing that horses do really well is to compact soils and that does not make for effective seeding or seed bed. Um, but if you can quickly impact an area and then um, add your seed and especially if you can combine that with rainstorm and perhaps another type of livestock to help work seed into the soil they can be really effective at creating seed to soil contact, which is vital, especially for grass germination. Um, so that's, that's another thing. All right. This is an example of horses as a cleanup crew. And also this particularly is, as you can tell, a cow pie. And you can see that the forage is grazed right up to the edge of the cow pie and somewhere probably lost now I had a picture of this with like a horse nose right here so um, you know from grazing dairy cattle and also from grazing horses that 
There's this thing called the zone of repugnance, which I think is the best name in grazing, but um, it's the area around a species' own poop where they won't eat. Sensible evolutionary tactic to avoid death. Um, but if it's someone else's poop, that zone of repugnance is way, way smaller and sometimes non-existent. So the horses will actually clean all of the beautiful forage that grows up around a cow pie and make use of it. Um, and the same is true with the horses. I can put cattle into an area where the horses have been for a while and they will clean around those um, horse, horse apples horse piles, whatever you want to call them, and they, um, and I think they really benefit because that's the highest nutrient area of your pasture. So I think probably you, I don't have any research, but you could probably um, look at the mineral content of those forages and, and see a significant difference. Um, this is actually the animals at Sterling, and <coughs> this is multi-species grazing with a bunch of uh, animals. We've got cattle in the foreground and sheep. There are also goats in this group, so that's our flurred group that can graze together and can have that positive effect on parasite density. Um, we can't graze the horses with them, but we can graze the horses behind them. So on this side of the fence, you can see the difference um, from this overmature pasture that we've let those ruminants pick through basically. So we, when the grass, this is probably late June, and the grass has definitely gotten ahead of us. And so we move the flurd very quickly through the pastures. We let them eat whatever they want, right? We never push them. We don't say you stay there till you've cleaned it up. We say go through, eat the leafy matter, pick through the legumes, just like cream, the pasture and then we move them on and in the meantime they do some trampling they're creating good soil contact with the plants they're feeding microorganisms they're fertilizing and putting moisture into that pasture and then the horses come behind and they do this great thing where they clip all of these clumps down to um, a much shorter level. And this is basically what we do at our farm as well. We follow the high nutrient need grazers with the low nutrient need horses, and we <coughs> make sure that they, the one thing that you have to make sure of is that the groups are um, fairly comparable in size um, so that they can get the right amount of feed for the right amount of time because what can happen is if you leave the horses here for say a week you're going to have overgrazed this area so this only works in brief um, sort of two to three day occupations um, and I think you can go up to five days total occupation and still be improving your pastures I like to keep it to three days or less. So um, back to the paper, I'll show you how one way that you can do that. Um, we have five horses and usually six to ten cows at home. And our paddocks are split into long strips. So there's a perimeter and then a series of strips that we graze through. Um, and so what we do is we have day one paddock for cattle. Then we got day two paddock for cattle. Day three for, for cattle. And on day three, we put horses into two of those three paddocks. Right? So there's no fence in the middle when the horses are there. So they're going to be there. It's day one of their rotation, but day three of the total occupation time. Okay, So this area here has a total occupation of three days. And the same will happen again on the next two. Right? 
So this is going to be day five, right? So we've got D3, D4. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm doing there? I see mostly nodding. So the, the horses get two paddocks, which gives them relatively more space and they're only in there for a day to impact that pasture area. So you're not giving them time to become like, I always like to compare it to taking my children to the all-you-can-eat buffet and turning them loose. I can guarantee they're not going to eat just all the broccoli. They're going to eat chocolate pudding. Um, and the same is true of animals. They're going to pick and choose what they want and as soon as that new grass starts to push its head up and try to grow, they're going to eat it because it's the chocolate pudding. Um, so this has worked really well. What do you see as challenges with doing this with your animals? Fencing, yep. What else? Um, I'm going to say they're probably, like these two together are probably a quarter acre. So they're not huge. Yeah. Are the blue lines, sorry, the perimeter of the horizontal line, is that permanent fencing? Um, or is it, are you doing it for all Perimeter, this is permanent. And then these are semi-permanent that we put up annually. Um, how about you over there with the dairy grazing? Your dairy cows are here, and your horses are here. Right. So this can be an issue for sure. <laughs> water can be an issue. We do run um, water in our paddocks, um, and we try to bridge two paddocks with one tub. Um, and if it's an area where we can't get water to them, we bring them back to the barnyard to drink, um, you know, twice a day for sure, and sometimes at lunchtime too if it's hot. So those are all issues. Um, how do you deal with that? What's a, something you could do in this system to help? Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and black plastic. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So you can add water systems. You can add laneways. Um, Sometimes, especially if you have a resource issue that you're addressing, you can get some funding to help deal with, um, with this. So you can add fences and water um, with someone else's money. Um, we'll go back to, uh, to that, but this is a system that, oh gosh, I've forgotten the author. There's a book called Paddock Paradise. So this is sort of an alternative. This, what I just talked about is working your animals into your grazing rotation and trying to help them to, um, to get all of their forage from pasture. Um, and grazing your higher nutrient need animals ahead is going to help them to have the right kind of forage when they go into a pasture. This is basically um, keeping your horses off of pasture. <laughs> um, but it can dovetail well with other systems. As you were saying, there are a lot of laneways and a lot of grazing systems. And this is basically treating the laneway as the paddock. All right, so this is a track that goes all the way around the edge of the, um, the horse paddocks. You can use this for grazing if you want on a rotation. You can use it as your riding area. You can put all kinds of other um, 
uh, facilities and things in there. And so some of these systems can come out looking like uh, landscape design for your horses. So I'm going to show you a little clip of a system that doesn't look that way. But um, I want you to look at the practicality of this system rather than, um, you know, if you go online and Google Paddock Paradise, you may find a YouTube video where the guy has a fountain in the middle of his horse area, which, you know, as a business venture, maybe you can appeal to really high-end clientele and you can bring in money. So there's certainly, you know, there are ways you can use that. But um, I think you want to be able to look at this as something that you can do yourself. So um, what they have here, they have a sand yard for rolling. They have a pebble area to help with foot um, hoof health. Uh, all these little green spots are where they feed. Um, there's water here, there's a mineral lick here, there's an equine herb garden here. Um, there are trees for shade. So these are all things that horses are driven to look for. So in a, a wild setting, horses move in groups and they tend not to be sedentary. They don't stand in a paddock all day and eat. If they did, they'd die. Um, so they need to keep their muscles moving. They need to eat small amounts on the move. And so you're feeding them and you're putting salt and water and minerals in places around this perimeter that keep them moving forward. Um, so it can be really a really healthy system for horses. Often um, there can be enough forage within this track that they can actually get a fair amount of grass out of the, um, the laneway. And you can also plan to have paddocks that they have limited access to at different times. Um, what else was I going to say? I don't know. So practically speaking, let's see, will this play if I click on it? Or will it do something else? I think there's going to be bad music, so sorry. So you don't need to have permanent fencing to do this. You don't need to have um, a huge amount of time or um, space to do it. And you can see in this setting, there's obviously been some not so great horse grazing going on in the middle, but the horses keep moving. Um, you can have different footing and you may have um, muddy areas, you may have include brush. You need to make sure that this track is wide enough for the number of horses that you're going to put in it because obviously six horses in a you know six foot laneway will have a lot of trouble. Um, but basically what this person has done is take all of their grazing land and create laneways which become the keeping area for the horses rather than the um, the grazing area. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. So you can you can definitely have like. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. So there are a couple concepts. One is that I think in any grazing system you kind of need a sacrifice area. So you need a spot that can get ugly. Um, obviously you want to try to keep that out of really wet muddy areas and you want to make sure that you have an option for keeping the animal out of an area if it does get too um, too wet and messy. Um, and so, let's see, we probably don't need to watch this forever. How do I stop it? Stop. Um, the other thing I was going to say is if you have a horse that has had uh, laminitis or founder, these systems can be really nice because you can help that horse to have 
the experience of being a horse without um, you know having the metabolic issues that come with grazing um, there are some horses that actually can't be put on grass at all which seems counter to evolution but um, so these systems can work really well for that <coughs> um, oh no how do I get to the next slide let's pretend we're done um, does anyone know how I get to this next slide? Ah, okay. All right. All right. Um, let's see. There was one other thing I was going to say about that. I've forgotten, but it'll probably come back to me. Uh, so that's one option. If you want to be grazing your horses and you want on grass as opposed to walking around grazing um, there are some ways that you can make a grazing system more um, suitable to horses and so this can apply to anyone's farm but also is particularly important for things like boarding facilities um, so planning and this is you know if we're making a paddock for our livestock usually exactly what we don't want to do is put up three times as much fence for you know one quarter of the area but if you make your paddocks very long and um, and intentionally plan that way you can make this fairly low labor input but creating enough length for the horses to get up to a full gallop and also to um, you know to have enough forage to eat uh, the UVM farm, if you guys get up there, has a turnout system like this, and they actually, at the gate end, have put down fabric and um, stay mat or you know stone to stabilize the areas near the gates because those still definitely become mud holes if you don't. Um, so that can work really well. Uh, my horses would stay in a paddock if I strung my knitting across the opening. Um, some horses, especially horses that have a higher flight reaction, need really visible fences. And so thinking about how you choose your fencing to make sure that they can see the perimeter. And also introducing them to the perimeter can be really good, so walking them around. Um, so they know where they need to be. Um, thinking about laneways and travel lanes is important. And um, another example of a, an effective system that I've seen was at East Hill Farm in Plainfield. And this is a boarding facility 